March 7, 1965, Selma, Alabama. A crowd makes their way across Edmund Pettus Bridge. Men, women, black, white, Jewish, all there for a single goal, to secure black people's right to register to vote. Their march is peaceful and nonviolent, but what they see on the other side of the bridge is anything but. Armed state troopers sent by Governor George Wallace to stop the march. The troopers' orders blare over a loudspeaker. The protesters are ordered to disperse. They ask to speak to the mayor. They're denied. They ask again. Denied. It begins to sink in that this isn't going to end well. John Lewis suggests that they should kneel and pray, and so they do. And as they fall to their knees, the state troopers descend upon them. Tear gas floods over the protesters as the troopers hail down insults and blows. The protesters try to scramble to their feet, try to flee back across the bridge. Some make it. Others don't. The troopers' rage is relentless, their hearts hard and cruel. What can men do against such reckless hate? As John Lewis said, march. When I was a kid, I hated Black History Month. It wasn't because I inevitably hear about the same five people, Harriet Tubman, George Washington Carver, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King Jr., and Malcolm X. It was because I would hear about the violence. Being one generation removed from the Civil Rights Movement meant every adult I knew, all my family, their friends, and my teachers had lived through that era. And the stories they shared were terrifying. Insults, attacks, kidnappings, killings. Every story about the movement had a dark side every civil rights achievement a violent response. And these weren't the sanitized stories you'd read in textbooks. These were first-hand accounts told by the people who saw them and lived through them. And they had the receipts. They had films and photos proving what happened. I saw my first picture of a lynching when I was six years old. The boy or man's body, or what was left of it, burned and dangling from a tree. That image locked into my mind. I've seen plenty of pictures and films of dead bodies, and a few in person. But in the 34 years since I saw that picture, I've avoided looking at any other hangings. But I haven't avoided what I saw in the rest of that image. These smiling faces delighted at this man's suffering. If you crop the image, you'd think they were at a circus or a concert. But no, they were grinning in ecstasy as they watched someone die. And I would see those faces in most of the pictures and films they showed in school. I would see them sneering at teenagers being escorted by armed guards to their high school. I would see them as police set dogs on men and women dressed in their Sunday best. I would see them even as a little girl tried to go to school. As much as those images frightened me, it was nothing compared to the anger they stoked. How could someone hate another person so much that they curse them, beat them, even kill them over eating at a counter, swimming in a lake, or crossing a street? And as much as a civil rights activist achieved, every achievement was met with violence and murder, and ultimately the deaths of people like Medgar Evers, Malcolm X, and MLK. I couldn't stand it. So, when I saw that civil rights leader John Lewis wrote a comic about his part in the civil rights movement, I avoided it. Part of it was also that many graphic novel memoirs aren't that great. But the book got glowing praise, and several of my friends really liked it, so I said, okay, fine, I'll check it out. Then I found out that it was a series, and I have this thing where I like to read them all in one go, so I decided to wait until it was finished. Unfortunately, what typically happens with waiting for trades happened to me. I forgot about the book. It didn't cross my mind again until the tail end of 2019, when Lewis announced that he had stage 4 cancer. I also got sick around that time, an early victim of a certain pandemic, and due to that, I kept forgetting or delaying about the purchase until the middle of 2021. But once I got it, it proved to be an excellent read. March is a story of John Lewis's journey through the civil rights movement up to the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. He gives an insight into the movement often not taught in school. The inspiration for his comic came from the very comic that inspired him to become an activist, Martin Luther King and the Montgomery Story. That comic helped spread the message of nonviolent protests throughout the South and later abroad. John Lewis shared this story about the comic with his telecom and tech policy aide, Andrew Aiden. Aiden was so inspired by the comic, the election of President Obama, and Lewis's stories that he suggested John Lewis write a comic about himself. Lewis hesitated, but eventually agreed, particularly after Obama urged him to do it. The condition was that Aiden would write it with him. Lewis and Aiden wrote the book and then signed a deal with Top Shelf to publish it. Nate Powell, the artist, heard about the book and submitted some sample pages, which Lewis and Aiden approved. They realized the story would take nearly 600 pages to tell, and so the story would be split up into volumes. They could be broken down into three arcs, desegregating stores, desegregating the buses, and finally the fight for voting rights. 
Credit where credit is due, Nate Powell created a masterpiece. He not only had to research all the locations, vehicles, and clothing of that period, he also had to draw some 300 real people and make them recognizable. That's not an easy task to do, and he mostly succeeds, although some faces do shift off model. His style lends itself to caricature, so his expressions are amazing. He nails the nuances of people's anger, frustration, joy, and anguish. For a comic based on real events, Powell is more than willing to make the images dynamic, to push the poses to evoke emotion. The black and white art adds to this. Powell gives us wonderful contrast with pages filled with black and gray tones to hammer in the scene, and then stark white pages to leave you captured in the moment. Where he really soars is in depicting what happened. Lewis and Aiden didn't avoid the brutality civil rights activists faced. We see it in all its detail and cruelty, from the attacks of state troopers to burning bodies. It's uncomfortable. It's frightening. It's rage-inducing. Even in my fourth reading, I found myself putting the book down just to take a breather. But I'm glad those images evoked that emotion because this is part of history we should never forget. We need to remember what happened in all its ugliness, to remember what it cost, to get us to the point John Lewis had only dreamed of, the election of the first black president. Lewis juxtaposes his story with the election of Barack Obama, opening on that cold January morning leading up to the oath of office and then to the dinner. I love that Lewis chose this because the importance of that moment seems to be lost on some people. It was a thing that could happen, but one you probably would never see. For someone who fought for black people to even be able to register to vote, to see a black man elected to the most powerful position in the world must have been beyond the dream. As talented as Powell is an artist, and as capable as Aiden and Lewis are as writers, I still don't think they quite got the moment across, but they get very close. And I think that happens by the scenes being juxtaposed with important moments during Lewis's activism. The book starts with his life on the family farm, where he was in charge of the chickens. As a boy, Lewis took to reading the Bible and wanted to become a preacher, so he would preach to the chickens. After a visit with his uncle in the unsegregated Buffalo, New York, Lewis got to see the stark reality of the segregated South, particularly his uncle having to avoid resting and buying gas in certain areas, lest he and his nephew be accosted or worse. A radio broadcast of a sermon by Martin Luther King Jr. inspired Lewis to preach his first sermon at 16, and it pushed him further into wanting to fight for civil rights. He tried applying to Troy University, but was denied because of his race. He planned to fight it and wrote to civil rights leaders telling them of his intent to sue the school, which led to a meeting with Dr. King. They told Lewis the risks, not just to himself, but also his family and neighbors. And while he was willing to take them, his parents weren't, and they refused to go along with the lawsuit. They told him to stay out of white folks' way, stay out of trouble. But Lewis had other plans. He was going to make trouble, good trouble. Lewis attended workshops on nonviolent passive resistance. He and the other members of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, four, planned on doing sit-ins to desegregate lunch counters, specifically Woolworth. This wasn't an easy task. They had to prepare themselves for what would come, the insults, humiliation, and violence they would face, and the rage it would inspire. They did this by doing it to each other. Remember, these weren't strangers. These were friends. Imagine saying the most vile and hateful things you could possibly say to someone you like, someone you love, just to find their breaking point, and then keep trying to break them. And it didn't just end with insults. They pushed each other, poured water on each other, spat on each other. They did the things that would be done to them. And sure, as Lewis admitted, some of it made them laugh. But everyone has their limit. Four finally got set to do the sit-in in Nashville. They did some test runs where they would go to ask to be served, get told to leave, and then leave. They were all ready to go when the Greensboro Four beat them to it. That didn't stop Lewis and his group. They went and sat in, and at first, they were verbally harassed. Then the beatings began. However, they seemed to peter out once the white teenagers realized no one was going to fight back. Eventually, the police arrested Lewis and his group, but instead of feeling fear, he felt liberated. He and his group refused bail, which embarrassed the racist court. The mayor, Ben West, later had them released. The black community in Nashville also boycotted downtown stores, forcing the mayor to offer a partial desegregation. But Lewis rejected this as nothing more than partial segregation. Lewis and the rest of the four went back to doing sit-ins. Unfortunately, it didn't take long for things to escalate. There was a bombing of someone's home. No one was injured, but the bombing was ignored by the authorities. That's one of the most frustrating parts of what happened. There was so much overt violence, and yet next to nothing was done to address it. Even people who seemed to side with desegregation, like Mayor West, would give lip service to the cause, but not act. Instead, he gave a very familiar response to the demand that lunch counters be desegregated. They're private businesses. They can do what they want. And that is what white people did, whatever they wanted. The more peaceful and benign the protests, many of which were led by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, 
the more violent white people became. They poured bleach and laundry detergent on people. They beat them. They mauled them. At one sit-in, they locked Lewis and a friend in a store with a pesticide canister. It could have killed them, and that was probably the idea. The door had to be cut open by the fire department. As the protests moved from desegregating stores to desegregating buses, the violence grew. At one point, a white woman told her seven or eight year old son to gouge out the eyes of a man she encouraged the boy to attack. The authorities also became part of the violence, and not just the local cops. It went up to the governors of the southern states, some of whom were involved with or were members of the Ku Klux Klan. That's what happened on May 14, 1961. The Freedom Riders, as they called themselves, were heading to Birmingham. Lewis had planned to join up with his group, but he received an offer from the American Friends Service Committee to travel abroad, so he left for Philadelphia to meet them in person. He planned to meet up with his group when he got back, but while he was in Nashville, he heard a news report that his bus had been attacked by a mob and firebomb. When the second bus arrived, those riders were also attacked. The chief of police in Birmingham, Eugene Bull Connor, was interviewed and asked why there were no police waiting at the bus station after the firebombing. His explanation? Mother's Day. We try to let off as many of our policemen as possible so they could spend Mother's Day at home with their families. The truth, however, is that he promised to give the KKK 15 minutes with the bus before making any arrests. Then there was the infamous bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church. That happened on the church's annual Youth Day, so the church was filled with children. That didn't stop white racists from bombing the church, though, injuring 21 kids and killing Addie Mae Collins, Carol Robertson, Cynthia Wesley, and Denise McNair. As Lewis says, quote, Four little children murdered in the house of the Lord. How could our quest for human dignity spawn such evil? That evil escalated as the quest moved from desegregation to voting rights. The South was notorious for blocking black people from voting by making registration impossible. While everyone had to fill out forms to register, the treatment of whites and blacks was very different. As Lewis says in a book, quote, In some places, African Americans were asked to count the number of jelly beans in a jar or the number of bubbles in a bar of soap. The registrar of voters held all the power and could decide to waive or strictly enforce any of the rules at any time for any reason. This included literacy tests, often only given to black applicants. They were filled with questions meant to trip up even the smartest person, but not everyone had to take them. Even if a black citizen were able to register, their name would be printed in the local paper, making them a target. The White Citizens Council could pressure their employer to fire them. Their house could be burned down by the KKK, or worse. And worse did happen. The plan was to go into the Deep South, into states like Mississippi, and register black people. SNCC even decided to hold a mock election called the Freedom Vote just to give people a sense of getting to vote. However, this was taken as an invasion, Lewis says, as an attack on the Southern whites' way of life. The state's governor and various city mayors responded by deputizing and arming dozens of white men, doubling the state patrolmen, and even bringing in an armored personnel carrier known as Thompson's Tank. Alan Thompson was the mayor of Jackson, Mississippi. All of this built up to June 21, 1964, when three young men, Mickey Schwerner, Andy Goodman, and James Cheney, went missing in Neshoba County. They were just the first. The bodies began to pile up, and the state and federal governments did nothing to stop it. Instead, people like FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover branded the movement as communist. It took almost two months before the three men's bodies were found buried in the woods six miles southeast of Philadelphia, Mississippi. Over the course of that summer, there were 1,000 arrests, 80 beatings, 35 shootings, 35 church burnings, and 30 bombings. All this violence to stop black people from exercising their right to register to vote. And as this went down, President Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964 into law. It banned discrimination in public places, barred it in hiring practices, and desegregated public schools, libraries, and parks. But it offered no voting rights protection. There was also no real attempt to stop the violence, so it got worse culminating in one of the most pivotal moments in modern American history, the March on Selma on March 7, 1965, which became known as Bloody Sunday because of the holy terror police rained down on the marchers. The violence the cops committed was nothing new. This had happened scores of times before. What was different were the cameras. The nation got to see the brutality, to watch as people dressed in their Sunday best, literally kneeling in prayer, were torn apart by clubs and dogs. While even that didn't stop the violence and the murders, it did shift the attitude about the civil rights movement and likely played a role in the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. It was one hell of an achievement, which has partially been rolled back thanks to its opponent's children. But the price for that victory was exceedingly high, and its aftermath is still felt today, which is why the Black Lives Matter movement, as ill-conceived as it is, took such a stronghold in the black community.
and why Southern governors like Ron DeSantis are attempting and succeeding in excising any mention of that price and the fight from being taught in schools. Speaking of which, Lewis gives us an insight into the inner workings of the civil rights movement not taught in schools. He lets us in on the infighting within the movement, from the growing divide and tensions within SNCC, to people's view of MLK as a bit of a spotlight hog, to the growing militancy and racism of the younger members of the various organizations as the 60s rolled on. The information about Dr. King was interesting because Lewis had nothing but respect for King, so much so that it was only in defense of King that Lewis ever violated his nonviolence position. Like I said before, everyone has their limits. All that said, Lewis wasn't too happy about King coming in at the last minute or sending out some of the difficult trials that young volunteers faced. He also wasn't pleased with Malcolm X's initial approach of racial separation and not fond of his by any means necessary idea either. But like with King, he had nothing but respect for Malcolm. I found the growing militancy and racism in the youth groups interesting because it played out similarly to how identity politics has in the modern progressive movement. Groups like SNCC began as multiracial and open to everyone, but as the violence increased in response to their activism, some of the black members came to resent that the little news coverage their beatings and murders got focused on the white activists. There was also anger at white liberals coming in and seemingly co-opting the movement. That's not what they did, but that's how some black people in the groups perceived it. There was also growing tension between men and women in the group, as women resented being treated as lesser because of their sex. By the time 1965 rolled around, there was an increasing desire among some to drop the nonviolence and start hitting back. This sentiment is what led to the creation of groups like the Black Panther Party. Much of this information is around, but often not taught in schools and generally not spoken about. And unfortunately, the people who lived it aren't going to be with us forever. By the time Lewis wrote March, he was the last living member of the group that spoke at Washington, D.C. His passing in 2020 was a reminder of how quickly we can lose our heroes. At the time of his passing, Lewis was working on the second arc of the story, Run. The first volume came out, but I couldn't find out if there were plans to release the other volumes or if he had even finished writing them. I hope he did, because Run leads into the creation of the Black Panthers and the fallout of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. That's an important part of history that everyone should know because it shaped the current political landscape. To understand identity politics, racial grievances, and the modern progressive movement, you need to know this history. Black history is, after all, American history, and Americans should know where we came from, no matter how ugly it is. And that brings us to a very sad point. Books like March might soon be completely banned from classrooms in conservative-run states. Any discussion of these events gets labeled as critical race theory and woke, resulting in several Republican-controlled state legislatures proposing bills to ban the content. Florida already passed such a law that effectively blocked anyone from mentioning the horror civil rights activists faced, lest it make white kids feel bad about themselves. That portion of the law was struck down by a judge who called it Orwellian. But that hasn't stopped some Florida counties from moving forward with the bans. This happened recently in Duval County, Florida, where the school board banned books, most of them related to Black, Latino, and Native American history, including a book about Harriet Tubman. Across the country, several schools have placed John Lewis's march on their reading list. Some may even teach it as part of a curriculum. Will this series be next? Will the images of racial violence that actually occurred be branded as woke and then memory hold? Will the story of sit-ins be written off as commie critical race theory and shelved? The sad truth is that there's a very good chance that could happen. And what a shame that would be, because had I read Lewis's book as a kid, I might not have avoided that history for years. I mean, I would have still been pissed. Full-on Yamamoto Bankai from Bleach level rage. A rage that burns so hot you don't even see the flames. But I would have also seen Lewis's hope. He never gave up. Not in his mission for equality, not on his nonviolent stance, except for that one time, which is frankly a gimme, and not on seeing people as people. No matter how horribly he was treated, he never compromised on his principles. He set a high standard, and he stuck to it, even when he knew he would not be treated the same by most of the white people he encountered. March would have inspired me the way that Star Trek and The Lord of the Rings did. It would have shown me that things can be bad, that the world can be a terrible place, but that it doesn't have to be. Throughout all of the evil this man experienced, there was still room for joy and passion and love and hope. That's a story every kid should know, no matter how ugly it gets in between, because in the end, his hope paid off, and he got to see a dream come true. There's a line at the end of a very good movie where a man says, I know now why you cry. And I thought I knew why my mother and landlady and Jesse Jackson were crying that November night in 2008, but I didn't. Not really. I didn't understand. Reading John Lewis's March? made me understand. So, I can't recommend this book enough. Buy it, read it, read it again, give it to your kids, put it in libraries, teach it in class. This is a book everyone should read. But what do I know? 
I'm just some guy.